chair of the call, Petty Dean. Good morning, Ms. Dean. I've come to please identify yourself for the record. My name is Penny Dean. I'm a licensed attorney in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, D.C. Circuit. I've been in all the federal courts and those circuits in the U.S. Supreme Court, among others. And I think, although the information the committee has received today has been interesting, there's been studies, there's been anecdotes, um, people have done internet research. But no one's asked people in the trenches what's happened. I haven't seen one person other than the assistant AG who said it sometimes should do prosecution, a person in the trenches who can tell you how it really is. I can tell you how it really is. I live it, I do it, I make a living from it. And not only can I tell you how it really is, I can tell you how it really was. And that's what's more important today to think about. I've heard representations made to this committee that we need to have confidence in our law enforcement and their decision should make us go forward. I'm afraid I don't have that confidence based on cases I've seen. I've had cases where the officer making the determination basically on the ground happened to have testified for one of the alleged victims um, in a child support case. I don't consider that person unbiased. I've had cases where I've said to the prosecuting attorney, please just talk to my self-defense expert. Please just give me a a chance to explain this case. Why should we waste state's resources of weeks after weeks in trial of an innocent man? And the prosecutor won't even listen to you or give you the time of day. This is a bad, bad, bad bill. And even under the old law, people who prosecuted who defended themselves in their castle, we're not talking about people on the street, we're talking about people in their own home were prosecuted. I've had cases where a gentleman was on his own porch minding his own business and never had a speeding ticket or a charge in his entire life. He could not get to the door in time to run in his own house. Why should you have to run in your own house when five criminals trespass on your property? The five men who came to attack him, the ringleader had a conviction, 1992 conviction, Hillsborough County Superior Court, and I'm happy to give the committee all the specifics. Um, sale of controlled drug, conviction, criminal mischief, conviction, possession of controlled drug. Conviction, criminal mischief. Um, that's just one of them. The second attacker had an equally fine criminal record, um, which included um, possession of a controlled narcotic drug, um, possession of shoplifting, lying crimes. These individuals were nothing but criminals, and they charged the victim. <coughs> we have certain police officers in the state. One of them stated to me, Beth Keys from the New Hampshire State Police, told me, your right to self-defense is your right to call 911. They don't believe you have the right to self-defense. This bill is absolutely bad. And here's what's even more important about this. When you've heard testimony saying that the burden isn't on the defendant, that is absolutely not true as a practical matter in the beginning. In order to raise the affirmative defense, and it's an affirmative defense, it's a defense of trial, that you get to raise when you're under bail conditions, when you're under the risk of trial, the expense of trial, which You've heard cases that get dismissed are 50,000. Cases that go to trial are 100,000. Ask yourself if you or your constituents can write a $100,000 check to a defense attorney. And, and I think the average person can. That's their entire 401k. That's their entire equity in their house. That's a lot of money for these people. You have to raise what's called a notice of affirmative defenses within 30 days of pleading that guilty in the Superior Court. And that notice of affirmative defense has to be accompanied by an affidavit with specific articulated facts that raise that defense. If the judge doesn't think you've made a defense, you can't even raise self-defense at trial. And the burden is on the defendant in that motion. You have to raise those facts. And if you don't raise enough facts, the judge says, no, you can't, you can't issue it at trial. And the bottom line is, you've heard prosecutors don't bring charges unless they think there's a good case. That's not true at all. I've not had my clients convicted, so the jury agrees with me. Juries agree with me that they shouldn't have brought charges, but the bottom line is a lot of people, you know, they say you can't retreat or can't be charged unless you couldn't retreat in complete safety. That is balderdash, balderdash. As a practical matter, we don't even get to those analysis. The tacky answers I see from prosecutors and police, you can tell that to the jury. You can tell that to the jury, or you can plead out now. That's the answer you get, and the question is, do you want New Hampshire citizens have to continue to experience this. You have to look at the 
information you've received from Soulfire. Most of the information you've received from Soulfire would not make it in a peer-reviewed journal. It wouldn't, because these people are not, don't have boots on the ground. They're not the people defending these cases. They're not the people trying these cases. They're not the people looking at what's happening. And I think most importantly, people have talked about the genesis of the original Stand Your Ground, what they call Stand Your Ground Bill. It was grassroots efforts of New Hampshire citizens that have that passed. No national organization came in and handed and bought all the legislators in the state. That would be insulting, quite frankly, to the general court. It was passed because grassroots activism. So people said, we have enough of being unfairly prosecuted. I've given case after case to different committees and said, look at all these cases where not guilty as were found. They're still prosecuting people under the new standard ground law. Um, I'm waiting to compile some information on a case that was just prosecuted in the Merrimack County Superior Court, tried ably by a local attorney. Unfortunately, the gentleman was found not guilty. And in that particular case, he was attacked by a man who weighed more than double what he was and about eight inches taller. Okay? And even then, he drew his firearm and didn't fire it. And so these cases happen all the time. And to take away this little bit of protection that citizens have right now would just be unconscionable. SB 88 started out as a really comprehensive protection package. And what passed that they're trying to repeal was just a small sliver of that. A very, very, very small sliver. And I think what the committee needs to look at, lastly, and I couldn't tell you the offense that I felt when the president of the Chiefs Association said that most citizens are not well trained or proficient. I strongly beg to differ, and I think an apology is due to the citizens of that state and that testimony. The bottom line is there's statistics out there that show that police miss more than they hit, and citizens rarely miss. There's statistics produced by all sorts of agencies that show that. But more importantly, to say that we don't understand concepts of penetration and such, that's just plain silly. I can tell you the number one question that I get from citizens, and I speak to a lot of different citizens and a lot of different events, is when can I can't sh can I shoot? And the number one thing they talk about is every bullet that leaves your gun has a lawyer attached to it. It's not only the potential um, criminal liability you have to worry about, it's the civil liability. And I tell people, teaching people to physically survive a self-defense encounter is relatively easy if they're willing to practice and pay attention. Teaching them to survive the legal aftermath is a huge undertaking. And it's really quite scary, quite frankly. Whenever a person calls me in those situations, I tremble in fear of them because I know the machinations that they're going to have to go through. And I'm happy to answer specific questions from the committee. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Dean. Are there any questions? Senator Velasquez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, um, Attorney Dean. You mentioned that there were difficulties in prosecuting the law prior to this. What have, what have you seen change since this law has been in effect? Unfortunately, not the change that I would have expected. And, and, I, and I'm very, very sad to say, and I don't have enough good data since then because the law is relatively new. And general rule of thumb, in my experience, some attorneys differ from time of charge till time of year before the jury is generally two years, if you, in my opinion, properly for a proper case. Others would say one year. It depends on the attorney. There hasn't been enough time for the pipeline to get full. But here's what I can tell you. I know of at least two cases where the jury agreed with me, or agreed with the attorney, I didn't try the case. Innocent people were tried, even under the new law, that should not have been tried. So they're still getting tried, and that to me supports my point of view. When SB 88 was being passed, stronger language that I had proposed that wanted in it should have remained in it. So, so we're not seeing, and I don't think any prosecutor has brought forth some case that, gee, we had this guy that we know he killed people and shot people and did all these bad things, and we couldn't prosecute him because of the new law. I've not seen any case like that. Senator Picardo? If I may, uh, Ms. Dean, as an attorney, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. We're in this room. You have a license to carry, not a permit, but a license to carry. Yes, and thank you for that. The absolute cool. license. And someone comes in, and you pull out your weapon, and you start shooting, and they did because they're beginning to shoot at all of us. What happens to you? I'm terrified. What happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually terrified. I can tell you when I was a first year law student, um, it, it, I was in 
the men I believe were going to attack me, and all I could think of is I'm never going to get through law school, the police are going to charge me, I have no chance, because even though it's four on one and I did nothing wrong, I know how I'm going to be treated by the criminal justice system and how the police investigate it. I'll tell you what is, I'm one of those stupid people that I would defend you guys, but if anybody is smart enough and been educated, they say you guys are going down because what I'm going to go through next is going to be living heck. I'm going to be under bail conditions, which hopefully the general court is going to change where I'm not going to be allowed to possess my self-defense tools as a, as a condition of bail. So I'm going to be out without a tool against whatever crazy person. Um, I'm probably going to be charged criminally and go through who knows heck and maybe face a civil suit. And you know what I'm saying? There's civil suits happen all the time, even in cases where you, where every one of you stand up and say, hey, she saved our life, he was shooting at us, we didn't do anything, we don't know who the guy is, he just was mad. I'm still going to face a civil suit and defending that civil suit just to give a decent answer and go through preliminary stages it could be 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Representative Itzy, say it's really late. Yep. I'm going to long. ask you to make your comments very short. They will be very short. Um, thank you. For the record, I'm Representative Dan Hitz. I represent Rockham County District 10. Since 1784, our Constitution made the clear statement that the people of this state had the right to defend life and liberty and protect property. However, in 1977, a law was established that required that people consider whether they can retreat or not before they defend themselves. That's been held up as the icon of why we should pass House Bill 135. However, after 1977 and to now, two salient things happened that make the passage of 135 imprudent and I would argue unconstitutional. First, the people in 1982 adopted part Article 2A, which states very clearly that not only do the people have the right to defend life and liberty and protect property, but they, they have the clear right to use a firearm to do that. The people made what was implicit in Article 2 explicit in Article 2A. Secondly, in 2005, the Supreme Court of the United States came out with an opinion in uh, the town of Council Rock, Colorado versus Jessica Gonzalez. I do have copies for you here. It's a lengthy opinion. It's uh, about 26 pages. But it boils down to this. The police do not have the duty to protect you from assault unless there is a positive statute to that effect and they have the funding to do it. And that's a critical piece because you think of what it would require to protect every person from assault at all times when out in the public. It would require that the state effectively hire a bodyguard for every person or every group of people. That is clearly beyond the means of this state, and I would argue probably any state, at least any state we'd want to live in. That puts Article 3 of our Constitution into operation. Article 3 says that we do surrender up certain of our rights when we enter into a society for the protection of others. But without the protection, the surrender is void. Knowing that we do not have the capacity to provide every citizen of this state with absolute safety, wherever they may go in public, that they have the right to be. We do not have the right or the power to require them to relinquish their rights of self-defense. It's that simple. We can't protect them. We can't require them to not protect themselves. We cannot rob them of those most precious and valuable and irreplaceable moments irreplaceable moments, requiring them to decide whether or not they and everyone around them can retreat with safety rather than figuring out how they will best defend themselves. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. The Chair will call Representative John Manley.